Welcome to Wine with Adam. I'm your host, Adam Bellos, and today we have a very special episode. We are outside of our normal studio. We are here in Jerusalem in the German colony with two very, very special guests. We actually came to them to film this episode. Obviously, a man who needs no introduction, Natan Sharansky and historian Gil Troy. Uh, today, we'll be enjoying the Gush Etzion Red Blend, the Spring River Red Blend. You can find it in both Israel and in America. I get to hear what you guys think of it, so let me know what you think. Let me know what you taste. Lachayim. Lachayim. Great wine. Great wine. Not only a great wine, but a great winery, great community. And in my opinion, it's uh, it's a wine that's fit for any occasion. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here with the two of you. Um, not very many people would understand what brought you guys together to write this book. Could I call it a, a manifesto. manifesto? A manifesto. A manifesto or a memoir festo? Uh, I we, would go we, with a memoir festo. We made up this word. I like uh, memoir festo. Because we're, we're, yes, it sounds like pesto. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is one thing that I learned in this book is that he's got this incredible sense of humor that that I feel like gets him into some, some sticky situations sometimes. You're much more harif than everybody thinks. Uh, I, th I think I, I'm much more light than people think. <laughs> <laughs> so what was this like? Well, indeed, we come from two very different worlds. Right? Natan was born in a town called Stalino at the time, uh, today it's Donetsk, and um, in the vast prison camp called the Soviet Union. And I was born in a big, happy shopping center called North America. Um, I never knew what it was like to be unfree until I spent three weeks traveling the Soviet Union in 1985, representing the Jewish people to speak to refuseniks. Did you guys? And, you, you guys? No, he was in the he right. was in the gulag, he was, and, and he yeah. was so deep in the gulag that everybody was worried about Yuli Edelstein. But and, and there was a chance of him coming out. People didn't even think it was possible for Natan Sharansky to ever get out. That was in April 1985, and by February 1986, miraculously, he was free. He was, but but at the time. Even though we, and we went there, we went there to be good Jewish citizens, but we didn't believe the Soviet Union would fall. We didn't believe these people would get out. We were just doing it because what, what, what could we do to help was just a little bit. Um, so we come from very different worlds. In the 1980s, when he's in the Gulag, I'm studying, I'm one of the spoiled brats of Jewish history, studying history at Harvard. And yet, there might have been a small difference between <laughs> right, the Gulag like and Harvard. Right, right? I mean, you know, there, there's nothing, right? Just they, a small one. Very yet, small one. It's a very big difference because in prison, you have all the moral clarity in the world. <laughs> at Harvard, you have all the moral confusion in the world. So. And, and yet, from these very different worlds, ideologically, we're very much on the same page. In writing the book, and we worked together for three years, it's the only project I've ever done with somebody, right? I write alone. I, I don't play in the sandbox with anybody And what about else. you? You've written um, with multiple people. Well, my longest project is uh, Gulag. My, <laughs> I'm a writer. It was a little bit longer. Uh, but yeah, the, in terms of writing the book, yes, it was the longest. He usually does things in nine-year chunks, and our wives yeah, were fearing uh, yeah. that we were going to be another nine-year chunk. Yeah. Um, but anyway, despite all our differences in style, in, 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 in the method of trying to tell the story, ideologically, we were always on the, we were writing the same page, and we never had a disagreement ideologically. Um, and that really shows the power of what you're trying to get at, which is Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And the power of the sense of that we have this common platform. We meet here in Jerusalem. We live 10 minutes away from each other as neighbors, as friends, as fellow Zionists. And yeah, you zeroed in on one of our shared fears. And I think one of the motivations in writing the book is it's heartbreaking for me to look at Natan and say, in the 21st century, with all the freedom that we have, we have a new totalitarianism that's spreading. And it's not coming from the top down, but it's coming from the bottom up. You guys wrote on page uh, 407, I recognize all of the unforgiving stereotypes. The good is bad, and the bad is good rhetoric I grew up with. The progressives risk yanking history backwards. Those of us who escaped communism script had grown into a fundamental liberal belief in individualism. It's sobering to watch so many privileged Westerners flee from it, or at least unknowingly weaponize the tools of the class struggle to which we fled. I thought that was extremely powerful. Um, I, I, you know, you start the book one way and you end it a completely different way. And I think more than your story, 
you're trying to get across something that's very underneath the surface. And I think you've been trying to do it with your books for a very long time. I feel like this has been like your war that you have been waging on behalf of the Jewish people, on behalf of identity, at a time when tribalism is being attacked, the actual real definition of nationalism is being attacked, being a Zionist, every single piece of our identity. You talked about the intersectionalism and the issue of us ignoring the rise of the idea of intersectionalism and then our problem with Israel being removed in the intersectionality of our identity. Really, I, as many other Soviet Jews, are really lucky. We learned very early what it is life without identity and without freedom. And when you discover this identity and freedom uh, together, you understand how deep is this connection that you cannot have any strength to fight for anything without identity. There simply are no values which are more important than your physical survival if you don't have identity. There is nothing to die for, there is nothing to live for. So uh, we come, uh, after the, our struggle the Soviet Union, we, you come with this very clear understanding that identity is very important for your freedom and that uh, in order to be free person, you should not go back into double think. The double think, that is a way to enslave yourself. So tell me what double think is. Double think, it's, it means that you never say what you really think. I became a loyal Soviet citizen at the age of five when Stalin died. My father explains to me how good it is for us, for Jews, that Stalin died, that I should remember all my life that miracle happened in the moment of the biggest danger to our people, uh, he died. But I should not tell it to anybody. I should do what everybody does. And I go back to the kindergarten and I sing together with all the children about son of all the people Stalin. And I'm crying together with all the children about death of Stalin. And I remember that miracle happened, I should be very happy. And I have no idea who of the children is crying like me or who are sincerely crying. That is typical life of Soviet double thinker. At the moment you cross this uh, border between double sink and descent and start speaking your mind, you have such a relief. You enjoy freedom. And you know how it is dangerous to go back and double sink. That by no way you'll agree with KGB to, to, to have any compromise to go back to double sink. And then you go to free world. And until this day, uh, all these years, what I'm writing about, what I'm, I'm trying to explain to the people that identity and freedom go together, that you cannot give up on one and keep the other. And what in the last years, I'm more and more concerned how easily people in the free world are giving up on their freedom by going to double sink, by deciding, okay, of course I support Israel, but you know, it's, it's not popular among my professors. So for the next year, I will not be speaking. And that's, that's how it begins, how it's, you are enslaving yourself. So uh, I'm really lucky that I could start from the position where it is so easy to feel the emptiness of the life without identity and freedom, and then to feel how great it is to enjoy both of them in connection with one another. So one of the uh, compliments we got about the book was from Leo Leibovitz from Tablet. Oh, he, yeah. said, he said, when. Um, where I expected to cry, I laughed, and where I expected to laugh, I cried. He said, when I'm in the gulag with you, I'm laughing. He said, when I get to the universities, I'm crying, right? And that's the upside down nature of what's going on today. And, and look, I'm a professor. I call myself a case of arrested development. I got to university and never left, yeah. right? I love the university. I don't like to bash the university. But the university I joined was the university of liberal values, the university of crit critical inquiry, the university of openness, the university yeah. which is the opposite of double thing. And it's, it's, it's really one of the major struggles of our lifetime to make sure that this totalitarianism, this creeping totalitarianism, again, from the bottom up, not from the top down, doesn't, doesn't destroy the university and doesn't destroy the liberal culture that we both worship. I think my point is, is that Gil has always been an articulator of the middle ground in politics, always yeah. listening to both sides. You have been a, an articulator of somebody that feels that all people deserve self-determination yeah. and identity. I mean, very few people have met with 
the high level people that you've met with. You went directly to Reagan to appeal for Soviet Jewry. You've you you know had a regular conversation with Nelson Mandela when he left. Prison. Okay, it was easy to me to go to Reagan. My <laughs> wife went to Reagan yeah. when, when the world didn't know who is she. Right. And you... that the, for my wife to open all these gates was very difficult, and that's why she needed all the world jury to, to open her gates. I simply followed the steps of my wife. The right. things that you guys wrote about her accomplishments right. blew my mind. Right. And she comes from, she, no, what fascinates me about No, that. I'm her accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm her accomplishment. Did we get that? Because that was, wow. I know you guys have both been married over 20 years. I hope to God I'm as in love with my wives as you guys appear to be. Like, that's yeah. a, like, that's I am a that. But what's amazing is they came from nothing, right? It's not like they came from identity nothing. It's not like they came from freedom nothing. They came from political nothing. Right. There are no political skills that you learn in the Soviet Union beyond doublethink, right? right? And when you see how savvy they were at playing the system, right? And here we have to give uh, hats off to Bibi Netanyahu and others who it came helped, in yeah. and, and tutored them. But the ability to learn so quickly is, is actually very, is, is, is a part of power story. But I want to get to the ideology here. Yeah, yeah, so, yes. yeah. We know there are organizational differences. We know there are turf wars. We know there's a kind of- You use the term turf war all the time. There's a, there, and there's also a personality. Some people go more established and some people more go, go more dissident. But right. there also are serious ideological disagreements. So Natan discovers this, the politiki versus the kulturniki, mm -hmm. right? That, that there's a, and, right? And politics that's versus culture. Politics right. and culture. And that's what hurts all politics. We need a state. Exactly. Haram. Haram. Culture. We need the yeah, language. Revival, right? mm -hmm. And we look and say, you're right. You're right too. I hope we don't do it in such a way that makes us sound wimpy, right? We're not just saying, oh yeah, yeah, you're, you're both right. We're saying, we see the essence and the need for a political state, especially in a world of anti-Semitism, especially in a world of nation states. We see a need to fight as a, an army. We see a need to, 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 to have an effective political establishment. But we also understand that it's not just about the body, but it's also about the soul, right? And at the end of the day, Achara Am, brought a soul, mm -hmm. and, and Theodore, Theodore Herzl defended the body, right? And this is, and, and again, one of the things that's so disappointing in the modern world as an academic, yeah. right, is everybody wants either or, right? It has to be, it has to be one extreme or another. And, and to come to the middle is not the weak position. I call this muscular moderation. It's actually the strong position, because you have to say, okay, I have to find some kind of balance. That's a lot harder than, than going to one extreme or the other. And I think, again, that's where we meet, because we're both trying to figure out identity and freedom. You know the, the the substance and the and the, and the, and the air. How do you how do you balance it out? And and we're both comfortable with not having the perfect formula, which and is so important. So scary. Today. So, no, but that's so right. important because in the internet, that's have, what makes you dangerous. Because in the internet, I have to reduce it to my tweet. Right. In the internet, I have to reduce it to to my tribe. So I have to I have to simplify, and we complexify, and that's. You know, and we try to do it in a way that's simple and readable, right? But mm -hmm. we also we, we also try to say if sometimes you do have to say it in a paragraph, not just in a not just in mm -hmm. a slogan. If you could teach everybody one thing about everything that you've learned and, and the whole experience of the book, mm -hmm. sum it up into one sentence. If I was twelve years old. Okay, and you wanted me to take every single thing I could from this book in one sentence. Like as a young Jew, what would it be? It's such a joy to live inside the history of your people and feel that you're moving together and that you're a free person. And in this world where people feel so alienated, so cut off, so lost, when you're part of the Jewish people, you're never alone. And that's an amazing gift. Lechaim, in, in uh, Russia, people drank a lot of vodka in order to run away from the life. Here we are drinking wine to enjoy life. To enjoy life. From, from wine to wine. Lechaim, well, we didn't have such a good wine in prison. <laughs>